Today, as part of a global event called 24 Hours of Reality, Moraine Valley Community College is presenting a panel discussion on global climate and the challenges we're facing and how we can begin to solve them. Uh, in addition, at the back, for each audience who fills out a specific form, a sign-in, so a lot of the classes have signs in, a tree will be planted in your name on behalf of uh, our, thanks to our friends at Climate Reality. Are those the, the forms are at the table. Cases, do you have the sign-in sheets for? That will come later. Okay. You're gonna use text. Perfect. All right, I wanted to introduce the panel today. So first we have Case Riphagen, and he is a volunteer climate reality leader. His education is, uh, he was educated in the Netherlands, a BS in chemical engineering, and an MBA in marketing. His work experience involves, he's retired from business. He retired in the business of fall 2018 after working in various capacities in the chemical industry for large multinational and medium-sized companies on all continents. Uh, he is, his skills include chemistry and engineering, networking, bottom line oriented, getting things done, and people oriented. He has many hobbies, which include cycling, hiking, fly fishing, Nordic skiing, sailing, cooking, and astronomy. So welcome to Case. <laughs> Our next speaker will be Jennifer Shepard, and she is a professor of Earth and Environmental Science at Moraine Valley. She started here in 2003 as an adjunct, and she was a full-timer since 2005. She has a master's in meteorology climatology from the University of Georgia. She also has a BA in physical geography and an AS in applied meteorology from the University of Kentucky. Her work experience include aviation meteorology. She was a research assistant at Kentucky State Climatologist Intern at the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Louisville. So welcome. Mrs. Shepard. <laughs> and last but not least, we have uh, Mitchell Baker. He's a professor of psychology at Moraine Valley Community College. He has conducted research in the field of environmental psychology and has hosted talks at conferences on that topic. Mitch has developed curriculum in environmental psychology and created a special topics course it's called Environmental <laughs> Psychology, offered here at the college this upcoming spring semester, so you can all register for that. Thank you. <laughs> Mitch is also licensed as a clinical counselor and is working on models of ecotherapy as a way of reducing anxiety, increasing one's sense of well-being, and repairing attachment-related disorders. So please welcome Mitch. Thank you. So on that note, Am I going to use my Am I going to use my own microphone? It's hot in here. Is that because of climate change or is it always hot in here? <laughs> take take off your sweaters. Anyway, um I'd like to start real quick because at the end we'll probably be running out of time. There's a dead stop, I understand, at 12.15, so we have an hour and 10 minutes. Uh, I'd like to start real quick with a thank you. Number one, give yourself a hand of applause for being here. Thank you for being here. Of course, most of all, thank you to Moraine Valley by facilitating this event. Uh, I think it's going to be a great event. It's part, by the way. If you, want, if you want to learn more about climate reality, I do have a presentation later on. Uh, but there is also a sheet. My business card is attached. So if you have particular questions, if you're interested in climate reality, uh, send me an email, give me a call. Uh, besides thanking Moraine Valley, there are a few people in particular that I would like to thank. Uh, where's Stephanie? There she is. Thank you, Stephanie, for facilitating this. Uh, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, of course, my
colleagues for the day or for the hour <laughs> sitting behind the table. And um, not to forget Dr. Linda Brandt. Thank you, Linda. So here's my story. And, and the story is about really why I'm here. How did I, how did I get here? So this is how it happens. Didn't they kill Galileo? This is my 10-year-old grandson talking. We were watching Jupiter through my telescope. Jupiter, its moons, beautiful evening. And very astutely, he made the comment, didn't they kill Galileo? And I said, buddy, why do you say that? He said, well, am I not right? And was Galileo not right? I said, yes. I got I to gotta hold this really close. <laughs> I said, yes, you are right. They killed Galileo, and he was right. He observed that the Earth is not the center of our universe, but the Sun is. And he did that, as you all know, by studying Jupiter and its moons. And then he goes on and says, are they going to kill the climate scientists? So this is a 10-year-old talking, my grandson. It came out of the blue. And I said, yes. Oh, I said, no. <laughs> I certainly don't hope so. <laughs> you might be right. There are people thinking that way. But we certainly have an analogy here between what Galileo observed and what happened to him. And some of the subjects revolving around climate change. Well, either way, this is the reason why I'm here. Made a big impact what he said, and I joined Climate Reality. Uh, I retired about a year ago, and I'm spending quite a bit of my time on the subject of climate change. It's one of the reasons why I'm here. And one of the reasons why 1,700 of my colleagues are giving presentations today worldwide on the subject over the next 24 hours. It's quite a big event. Um, I hope that that change in my outlook and my behavior, if you will, because of one single statement from a 10-year-old is going to resonate and that you will pick up on this and also actively be and will be involved in the subject of climate change. Thank you. So I have been invited here to talk to you about the science aspect of climate change my background, so it's where I feel most comfortable. I get a little excited about getting another chance to talk about climate, talk about the way that the atmosphere and the land surface are so dynamically related. I title this topic, Follow the Energy, because that's really what it comes down to. When we study the atmosphere, we have to understand that it's actually a system science. When we think of the Earth itself, the Earth is a system. Remember, systems mean that it's a group of interacting parts that you know, work together to perform you know, separate functions, but they work as a whole. Well, the Earth is a system, but the atmosphere is a system within the system. So anything that we're talking about with respect to climate change, climate variability, ultimately involves alterating some aspect of the system. And so that's what a lot of my conversation today will be based on, 
is how do those changes take place and ultimately what their net effect will be. So when we talk about system science, particularly climate system science, there's a lot of conversation that's built around feedback mechanisms. There are positive feedbacks within systems, climate systems as well, and there'll be negative feedbacks. And the role of a climate scientist is to try to sort of keep up with what feedbacks will take place. What's the net result of an initial change? So when we talk about positive feedbacks, this is where there's been some initial change. Let's say the initial change is that temperatures are rising. But it could really be anywhere within sort of the loop. But that initial change leads to other changes that ends up sort of enhancing the initial change. Sometimes this is referred to as the vicious cycle. And this is ultimately the fear of climate scientists is that we are essentially in this kind of vicious cycle positive feedback loop. And the example that I bring here is relatively simple. Not too complex to follow. You don't have to be a meteorologist or have advanced degrees in atmospheric science. But we can follow the kind of continuum. Temperatures rise. Well, if temperatures are warmer, uh, that would allow that ice would melt, snow would melt. We see this every season, no surprise. And the melting that they're referring to is the Arctic sea ice. Right now, the predominance of Arctic sea ice is diminishing rather drastically. But Arctic sea ice, which might just seem like a kind of benign floating ice, nobody really cares about it, right? But that Arctic sea ice works as a natural cooling agent for the Earth's climate system because it has the ability to reflect incoming sunlight. So when that Arctic sea ice is melting, that means more of that dark ocean is exposed. Well, darker oceans imply that you have lower reflectivities. That's a concept referred to as albedo. If you have low albedos, you have less reflection, you absorb more of that energy, which means you end up with temperature rises. So that's one example of where this initial change has elicited other changes that only enhances that initial change and then that vicious cycle. But there are negative feedbacks, and these are just as complex. Where negative feedback is sometimes thought as a kind of a return to a steady state, a return to equilibrium. So instead of enhancing the initial, it's the thought to kind of cancel out. So there are a lot of, um, there's some research that suggests that there are negative feedbacks built in naturally within the climate system that may potentially lower temperatures. And so for a long time that was a talk, oh, don't worry, the Earth will reach some equilibrium, it'll be fine because the Earth knows what to do. But what they're realizing now is a lot of these negative feedbacks, and by the way, don't think negative feedbacks is like negative, bad, positive, good. It's not the way you want to think about it. Negative just refers going back to the nice steady state that it was in. So recent research suggests that any of these negative feedbacks that we're finding are much more localized and a much smaller temporal scale. And they probably will not cancel out the net effect of warming. But here's an example of a negative feedback mechanism. Same initial change, warming occurs. Well, if warming occurs, that allows more water to evaporate off of oceans. In fact, that's how moisture is transferred to the atmosphere. Well, if you have greater evaporation rates, that means you have greater potential to form clouds. More cloud cover means that you reflect more solar energy away. And if you're reflecting more sunlight away, less of that energy is able to reach the surface, be absorbed by the surface, and warm temperatures. So just by enhancing cloud cover, the thought is that maybe that can lower temperatures. Right? After all, we all know that cloudy days tend to be cooler than warmer days. So maybe the net effect will be, we'll just get cloudier as we get warmer. But here's the problem. Clouds are actually, they have dual roles in the atmosphere. Yeah, they do reflect incoming sunlight and there is some cooling effect that takes place. But clouds also have the ability to absorb heat. And they absorb this infrared, these longer wavelengths from aerosols in the atmosphere, uh, particulates that are out there, um, from 
heat given off by greenhouse gases, uh, but in most particular, from the heat that the Earth's surface is constantly radiating out. So yes, while there's maybe a dimming effect of cloud cover, there's more likely a more enhanced warming because of the long wave energy fluxes that essentially trap the heat. Kind of like having a blanket on you at night, you get really hot, what do you do? You remove that blanket off and you cool down. But if we end up with greater amounts of cloud cover, we just maybe end up trapping most of that long wave heat from the Earth. Of course, there's no good talk about climate unless we involve how the carbon cycle works. And I'm not going to get into too much detail. I recommend that you take an Earth or a natural science class again, if you haven't already. <laughs> But the idea is that, you know, the carbon cycle is a natural cycle that involves an uptake of carbon and an, uh, kind of a, an, uh, a release of carbon. And it's a, you know, it's a natural cycle that we probably have adjusted. <laughs> that would be an understatement. So once again, this is a follow the flow of energy. If we're disrupting the flow of carbon, adding too much or without the necessary kind of um, withdrawal, then we're going to have a net kind of warming effect. Because it turns out that carbon, particularly in carbon dioxide form, is a powerful greenhouse gas, which means that it does not absorb sunlight. That's one big misconception that greenhouse gases absorb solar energy. They do not. They absorb long wave heat energy. And since they have the ability to absorb heat, any rate of increase you know, just by default, is probably going to lead to rising temperatures. Now, this is most recent data at Mauna Loa. It's one of our uh, most well-used observation stations for carbon dioxide measurements. And you can see, you know, even when they trend line, the black line is the trend, the red values, the up and down, show us seasonal changes in carbon dioxide. This is typically related to plant decay versus, you know, positive photosynthesis during seasonal changes, you know, spring and summer, warm season, more photosynthesis, more decay during the winter and the autumn, right? But over trend lines, if you see that black trend line, you can see, wow, that is an incredible rate of increase. So when it comes down to it, when we're altering the carbon cycle, which we think of as, you know, burning fossil fuels or perhaps the wildfires, natural or unnatural, uh, you know, they do add you know, more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, and since we know carbon dioxide has the ability to absorb heat, long wave energy, then the idea is that, yeah, that would probably lead to warming. But that's not the only place that we are altering that carbon cycle. You know, there's lots of research going on into what's going on with the world's oceans, um, particularly of the phytoplankton that have very similar um, photosynthesis capabilities of taking in carbon dioxide. Um, how healthy are our forests? You know, what are we doing with land use changes and how do they s impact sensible heat exchanges? I kind of gather this all under the title of anthropogenic disruption, so man-made disruptions, <coughs> right? So we already understand that greenhouse gases, we talk about carbon dioxide as one, but there are numerous others, methane, nitrous oxides, but even water vapor is a greenhouse gas. And there's a great deal added by fossil fuel combustion, but we also have to imagine that, you know, this change in the flux of carbon dioxide is also related to land use changes. When we remove vegetation, we remove the ability for the Earth's surface to store that carbon dioxide, right? When we do this for, whether it's for agricultural industry or, you know, urbanization, uh, <laughs> we can talk about, you know, the expansing of ex expanding strip malls over the suburban area, I mean, that all removes vegetation. And that's where our carbon needs to go. We all love forests. If you, don't, if you haven't been in a forest lately, <laughs> you should go to one. And you should thank your forest. You should, you should hug your trees. Because forests have a net cooling effect on climate. And we're not just clear cutting in the Amazon and, and you know, in parts of the Congo Basin. You know, there's clear cutting and logging activities that are constantly removing forest cover in North America. And I, I like this graphic because it shows us how tropical forests, that would be low latitude, equatorward forests, temperate forests, which is us, and then even the boreal taiga style forests, they all absorb incoming sunlight. They all absorb you know, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, they're the carbon dioxide sink. 
They release oxygen, of course, and they also cool. They cool by evaporation, they cool by transpiration, and even when there's weak cooling effect, there's still a cooling effect that takes place. The other reason we need to be concerned about how we're managing our land use is that not only does it remove water from the atmosphere, um, but it disrupts the flow of water. You know, and we talk about heating the atmosphere, but climate change involves just not changing temperatures, but climate change is altering, you know, landscapes and ultimately their climate patterns. Uh, what's, you know, what could possibly grow there and not grow there anymore? Uh, changing of growing seasons, which ultimately impact agricultural lands. So when you remove forests, forests transpire a great deal of moisture back to the atmosphere. In fact, in rainforest areas, we say that forests actually, oh, they recycle their own precipitation. We can't say that about where we are. We have to get our moisture from typically the Gulf. So when we remove these, you know, really wet sources, we ultimately lead to desertification. E even on a smaller, more mild scale, we end up with a drier, hotter surface. But also remember that forests actually allow water to effectively infiltrate, that seep into the ground, to recharge our groundwater supplies. This is the groundwater that most of the world uses. So instead of running off over the land, eroding the land, you know, um, th those forests allow the, the effective you know, infiltration. Right? Removal of forest reduces the amount of moisture back to the atmosphere, causes those surfaces to become drier and hotter, but it lowers the water table, making it more and more difficult to extract water. Right? It's a human concern. Here's another example of anthropogenic disruptions, growth of cities. You know, suburbanization, urbanization, you know, taking you know, forests, moving it to suburban plots. That top one looks like any you know, Chicagoland expanding you know, into like Kane and Kendall County. I and mean, we've seen this over the last couple decades. That bottom picture is in China. And look at the transpiration. Just think how much critical storage has been removed just by the expansion of that city. That's why it's so important to make sure that we are continually sort of greening our cities. It's not just for aesthetic appeal. It has a real implication on the flow of energy. The, the picture in the bottom right-hand corner is actually um, New York City. It's what New York City, Long Island, looked like before we moved in. So if you want a basic crash course, right? This is your Cliff Notes, your climate system, science for dummies. Understand your greenhouse gases. Understand how rise in population and uh, urbanization and the increase in energy consumption all alter that flow of energy. So what does this mean for us? The Midwest, the Great Lakes region? Well. All the regions, the Northwest, the Southeast, the Central Plains, they all participate in a national climate assessment and they specify just for their regions and they spend a lot of time reading through peer-reviewed research and literature to find out what they are most concerned about. And so this is what they've come up with. For around here, we increase our growing season temperature which might seem like, oh, that will lead to greater productivity. Not necessarily. Higher growing season temperature means that we probably will have more precipitation, more rainfall. More rainfall means greater amounts of soil erosion. The possibility of higher temperatures leading to more drought-like conditions. Our late season growing seasons are uh, great times to produce uh, our, you know, our agricultural products that sustain us for the rest of the year. And of course, we also have to consider the possibility of rising temperatures, more moisture climates in certain places, but drier than others, as being you know, perfect you know, harboring zones for invasive species, pests, diseases. And overall, they're, they're concerned about the, the biodiversity of this region. I would say the most alarming thing that may be occurring, which, um, which I am gonna spend more time researching this independently, is the moderating effect of our Great Lakes is diminishing. So one of the great things about living in this region is that, yeah, we are more of a continental location, so uh, we have more extremes in temperatures, both, you know, warm season temperatures and cold season temperatures, but, you know, living along the Great Lakes allows us to have a more temperate climate. 
because water kind of moderates everything. It keeps us a little bit cooler near the lake during the summer months, but a little bit warmer than, let's say, your you know, Dakota counterparts during the winter. So there's this net kind of moderating effect. But the problem is we're noticing that ice cover uh, is changing, and surface temperatures of the Great Lakes are warming at pretty alarming rates. And so that natural moderating effect that we get in our region, uh, which you know, impacts our growing season, impacts our industry and transportation, um, it's changing. So that's all I have in terms of the science. I will um, give you a slight caveat. In order to talk about climate science, I would need a whole semester. And I probably wouldn't really gather all that information. So I've abridged this tremendously. So there are so many more facets of climate and the flow of energy that I could have delved into, but in the effort of time, I haven't. Um, so just keep that in mind. I'm, I'm, I'm taking just a, a small niblet of what's going on in the atmosphere surface interface. Right. I'm going to pass it over to Mitch now. Thank you, uh, Jennifer, for sharing that passion with us case for your uh, compelling story. Uh, I'd like to extend my gratitude for being included into this talk today. Um, so what role can psychology play in global climate change? First, I want you to think about the communities you belong to. Think about your home, your neighborhood, the schools you go to, Moraine Valley, your place of work, for some of you, the houses you worship in the places and spaces you hang out with your friends, family, the park you walk your dog to maybe. How many of you identify with such spaces? Okay, a few of you, thank you. How many of you take pride in your sense of belonging to those spaces? All right. How many of you would pick up some trash or take that extra effort to keep it beautiful because you identify with the place? All right, great. Now, how many of you would feel hurt if those places suddenly became unrecognizable? All right. Now, I'm betting most of you would care quite a bit about losing one of those spaces or more. Now, I want you to think about the commutes that you have between those spaces, maybe from your house to Moraine Valley, from schools to your jobs. How do you feel about those in-between spaces? Do you notice them? Do you feel the same connection to place at 50 miles per hour? Or are these just points in between destinations? When life becomes about destination and not about journey, we experience detachments. 90% of our day is spent in built environments. Think car, think house, think this library, restaurants, and in any given day, about seven and a half hours are spent in front of screens. We're losing our attachment to place and space, which allows for both psychological and proximal distance. When we don't feel connected, we don't care as much. One thing that psychology can teach us about climate change is that scientific data will often lose out to a compelling emotional story and stories create meaning and sense of community, such as the one Case shared with us about his grandson. So share your stories, and others will do the same too. So why don't we accept the science that Jennifer presented? Why don't we act on the science? Probably one of the most prevalent theories out there are the effects of media. I could spend the time that I have talking about different psychological theories and giving you context for each one of those, but I want to spend a little bit about, uh, I want to spend most of my time on the aspect of communication and how we're shaping our messages. The rules that govern media often collide with the goals of disseminating scientific knowledge. And writing for the purpose of scientific knowledge, or excuse me, scientific publications such as the journals we have here, rarely mobilizes behavioral change. If you've had to read a journal article for a class, how motivated are you? Like, I'm gonna go do this. This is so interesting to me. Media, on the other hand, is often skewed for shock, right? It's attention-grabbing headlines, conspiracy theories, 
sensational rejections of science, that's what makes news. The problem is provocative headlines and sound bites become what people grab onto and they become our norms. They become the accepted truths. How many of you guys use Twitter? Okay, quite a few. All right, fair enough. So for example, the average tweet is only around 30 characters, though you can use much more than that. So for those of you who do use Twitter, how often do you um, read what's behind the tweet? Okay, now I'm seeing no hands. <laughs> so that's about six words. Your basic consumption of, of information is all in six words. Depth and validity of information is often lacking. The scientific community, though, has to do a better job on shaping its message regarding climate, climate change. We have a tendency to overestimate what people know and assume that they've heard it all before, so we keep our mouth quiet and don't share our information and our knowledge. I still hear questions about belief, like belief in climate change. Like, do you believe climate change is real? Do you think this is really happening? It's like the equivalent of asking someone, do you believe in the Easter Bunny? And I don't think that's the kind of sh message we're trying to shape. Statements of conviction need to be made, especially over for new forms of media, yet kept simple and digestible because the reality is that's how we consume our, our, our information, how we consume our news. Trustworthiness of science has deteriorated significantly under our current administration and media, story, and media stories are sensationalized and exaggerated. You pretty much have a consensus of a climate crisis from an academy of sciences on one hand, right? A full consensus. But the lone eccentric gets equal media play. One distension because that's a sexy headline. And then that becomes the collective consciousness or the collective psyche that this concept or topic is uncertain or it's debatable, which it is not. In fact, the US media, compared to other developed countries and advanced nations, suggest greater uncertainty about anthropogenic climate change than anyone else. But not all media is bad, right? This isn't a doom and gloom talk. Not all media is bad. But the, the image of the lonely polar bear on sinking ice suffers from overexposure. Other messages that are trying to bring it closer to home such as a smokestack or a polluted gray sky, that too is altogether too grim. Signals indicating progress, that's the way the message needs to be shaped. Demonstrations that you and I, that we are making a difference and it really does matter. Psychologists know that when messages become too fatalistic, we feel lousy and no one likes to feel lousy, right? We try to resolve those unpleasant feelings and the way we do so is, you know, we, we, we don't want to get to the point where we start saying, oh, you know, it's, it's already too late. What can I do? I'm just one person. We don't want to get to that. Our message needs to be supportive. We all too often grasp for emotional focused coping strategies to numb and avoid the pain. So think about the final exams that are coming up and how you might prepare or maybe the preparation for giving a talk such as this. Do we just go ahead and watch Netflix? You know, I don't want to think about it. It's too much trauma. Or do we go ahead and study or do some research to present the information and prepare and bring about the actual desired behavioral change that we're shooting for? Uh, there's a gentleman by Dan, uh, the name of Dan Gilbert who is best known for the psychology of happiness. And he says that people tend to respond strongly to four triggers. And he dubbed this as pain. So P-A-N, P-A-I-N. P-A-I-N, excuse me. So we respond to pain. And the P stands for personal. So how we need to do this is we need to make the message more personal. Many of us are not impacted directly. We don't have droughts or wildfires here in Chicago. And the images and animals that we'll never see, it's very difficult to connect to. We need to share about the flooding that we're experiencing in our own communities as we're clear cutting uh, locations and expanding the malls. The other thing is abrupt. The A stands for abrupt. We're not hardwired to notice slow moving threats or changes. Think of that relative. Maybe with Thanksgiving coming up, the relative you rarely see who says, oh my gosh, you look so different. You've changed so much. Of course, you haven't seen me in a year. Quite a few things have changed. But the people you see daily never make such comments. If anyone's familiar with uh, the psychologist Dan Simons, he did some research on attention. And if, if you haven't seen, I don't want to spoil it for you, but maybe it's an interesting Google search. But he wanted to 
he demonstrated how people don't pay attention to uh, non salient things, not obvious things. So he had, so go ahead and look for it. Count the uh, number of passes in a basketball game and see if you see some interesting things or are able to pick those up. So I don't want to spoil it for you. The other part is immoral, the ace for immoral. We are, however, hardwired to respond to repulsive things. But many of us would not categorize our commute to work, the airplanes we travel in for vacations, the hamburger we're going to have for lunch, on the single-use paper plate, drinking from the single-use solo cup, as immoral. In fact, many of us have social support and validation from our networks that this is the appropriate thing to do. Maybe you have cloth napkins in your home and you're not using paper towels and everyone's looking at you, why don't you have like cloth, why, why do you have cloth napkins? That's such a hassle. We, you know, we need to start to change social norms. When we are doing so, I mean, we have refill stations here on campus, we have the Impossible Burger, right? Beyond Burger, Beyond Meat, all that stuff. It's a good brand, let's go try it. The oh, sure, all right, fair enough. Now, we are a future-oriented group of people here, and we believe in our exponential ability to solve the climate crisis through science and technology to terraform the planet back to a place where we want to, that we're proud to call home. But when the threat is all too often considered to be ambiguous, uh, it's very difficult to achieve. The problem with the, the way we shape messages today, according to Gilbert, is that Climate change does not have any of these attributes. None of these exist within the problem of climate change. It's hard to see. People are aware of the problem, but reluctant to lower their standard of living. And Nobel Prize winner Dan Con Daniel Kahneman says that climate change is the perfect problem because it's not obvious. It requires us to accept short-term losses which people do not like to do. And it's uncertain as it's presented in the media, right? When you have equal, equal airtime but an unequal voice, perception becomes reality. Rhetorically, does it matter in the end if people change their beliefs about causes of climate change as long as they adapt or adopt more sensible sustainable pro-environmental behaviors. I'll close with this. Don't be afraid to be a leader and use the power of influence next time when you're Instagramming a picture of your latte art. Out, do so in a mug, a reusable mug instead of a single-use cup and let everyone know that that's the way you prefer it. Social norms change by actions started by individuals. Eventually, you'll find a first follower and start a movement. back. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, great, great subjects, great points. On the point of the Impossible Burger, who would have thought just like two years ago that Burger King would have such a product? It's amazing. That's true. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me better? Uh, although I'm, pr I'm quite sure that you got what I just said, so I'm not going to repeat it. Um, my presentation is focused on one word, and that's change. And you will see that in a minute. And it's about the question, must we change? Can we change? And will we change? And particularly that last chapter, I'm going to spend most of my time on that last chapter, that last question. 
will we change? And there is actually quite a, a lot of what you read in the news and see in the news and hear in the news is bad news. Well, there is plenty of good news. And that's where you guys come in. That's where we all come in. There's a lot that can be done besides eating impossible burgers. And on a side note, you'll be amazed if we all, there's just one little thing, but there are many little things. If we all would quit eating meat, what kind of an impact that would have? Not saying that you should, just saying if you would. So, that's the one right? How does that work? Arrows? Okay. So, uh, I should have asked this question a lot earlier. How many of you have your cell phone on you? And I know that some of the professors are going to kick me when I say, I'm going to ask you to use it. If not during the presentation, then certainly shortly after the presentation. But two hashtags. Uh, I won't leave it on here very long. But if you make pictures and use these hashtags, they will feed into the climate reality system. Uh, all 1,700 present uh, presenters today. And it will be a huge database of pictures. Uh, so we'll talk about those hashtags later. Or if you made a note, use it. Go on Instagram. This is a very telling picture. It's our planet. It's the only one we have. This picture was made during the last uh, Apollo mission in 1972. Uh, this is what, what is at stake when I talk about change, when we talk about the problems and the solutions. This is what, it, what is at stake. And guess what, guys? We only have one. Now, my, that same grandson, by the way, commented on that, and he said, well, wait a minute. Isn't Elon Musk working on traveling to Mars? We can go there. Well, maybe so. But still, we only have one. Change. Must we change? Can we change? Will we change? The first chapter, for a large part, is touching on the science of climate change. So I'll go through that in a couple of minutes. Almost like it looks like one of your slides, right? It's much more dynamic. Uh, it's very dynamic. That's why this file is 110 megabytes. <laughs> <laughs> but it boils down to the biggest sources of greenhouse gases, uh, oil production, all of this revolves around carbon and the generation of carbon dioxide. I know, there are other greenhouse gases, but carbon dioxide by far is the most important one. Uh, coal plants, industrial agriculture, and most importantly, transportation. I often get the question about big money and big corporations and what, what should be done and what could be done to change their impact. Well, guess what? I heard this expression a while back and it's pretty powerful. We all have blood on our hands. Who of you drives an electrical car? Well, I don't. I should, but I don't. So we all have blood on our hands, but we also can be part of the solution. Few, a few powerful slides. The largest source of global warming is the burning of fossil fuels. So this goes back to the start of the Industrial Revolution in the late eight, mid 1800s to 2016. And something tiny that you might easily overlook all the way here on the right, what is it doing? It's actually flattening out. It's good news, but it's not good enough. But there is some good news in that chart. But the bad news is obviously the enormous rise, the exponential rise 
in the burning of fossil fuels over the last 150 years. Another chart. I like charts because they tell a story. Global surface temperatures, about the same time period, the 2016, departure from average. It's getting pretty hot, not just in this room. 16 of the 17 hottest years on record have occurred since the year 2001. I don't know about 2019 yet, but it looks like that trend is continuing. Jennifer talked about this in, in detail, uh, heat content. So a lot, a lot of the radiation is being absorbed by water. The oceans are getting hotter and quite a bit hotter. One Somebody was asking me the other day about the snow that we got so early this year in Chicago. Well, if you go to Traverse City or if you go to Minnesota, they had up to two feet of snow uh, over the last couple of weeks. Do you think global warming? Come on. Well, the reason why there was so much snow <coughs> in the Midwest is because of a huge pocket of warm water south of Alaska. That's what this is. So this huge pocket of warm water in the northern Pacific is diverting the jet stream and is pulling cold air in from the North Pole. Uh, and that's why we had all that snow. Worldwide extreme weather cat catastrophes uh, broken down by various uh, elements, storms, floods, uh, fires in California, on and on. The trend is clear, up and up. Top ten, city, top 10 cities at risk from sea level rise in, I know it's far out, 2070. And there was actually an article in the New York Times just last Sunday touching on this subject. And the, the headline was really interesting. The headline said, Climate scientists are wrong. Well, that for sure caught my attention. And what the article said basically is that climate scientists are wrong because they're too conservative. Things are happening a lot quicker than we thought only a few years ago. So Miami, uh, I would certainly not suggest to uh, buy any real estate in Miami at this point, or in Calcutta. So the cost of carbon, all kind of different issues. Droughts, storms, melting glaciers, uh, water scarcity, sea level rises, infectious diseases, and it's being considered by many, many sources as the number, threat, number one threat to the global economy. So the next question. Must we change? The answer is a resounding yes. We must change. And here's the million dollar question. Can we change? Another yes, we can. Because there are many solutions at hand. And that's where the focus is gonna be. So here, here are some examples of what has been going on over the last 10 to 50 years. Uh, green energy progress. The 2000 projection was worldwide wind capacity will reach 30 gigawatts by 2010, about 10 years ago. Two, three years ago, that goal was exceeded by a factor of 16. So the growth, if you drive through Indiana or Illinois, you see all the windmills, a lot of them, that's where this is coming from. Global wind energy capacity. Look at the chart. Look, look at the exponential growth. Just over the last 10 years of wind energy installed. It's enormous. Uh, 
global wind could supply worldwide electricity consumption for the same goal. Solar energy, another really important one. Um, another piece of news yesterday that they now have captured really uh, uh, new technology uh, has been developed where sun, sunlight can be captured and actually make, it, it's hot enough, I'm not talking about solar panels here, but the energy that's being captured by this new technology, and one of the major funders was Bill Gates, is um, you can make concrete by using solar power. And we haven't even talked about concrete, but making concrete is a major contributor of uh, carbon dioxide. Another really fantastic number. So in 2016, uh, solar energy installation was exceeded by 75 times uh, relative to an estimate that started in 2010. World solar PV means uh, photovoltaic installations, the growth uh, is off the chart. Maybe some of you have already solar panels on your house, or I believe more, is Moraine Valley using solar panels? Yeah. Okay. Let's just start. Uh, this is a really interesting one too, the cost of crystalline silicon solar cells. So it's not just part of the growth is by new, de new technology that's being developed and capacity that uh, has been installed and being used, uh, enormous impact on the cost. And ultimately that's where it boils down to, cheap. Right now solar and wind uh, generation is it's growing such that it's actually quite a bit cheaper than many alternatives, existing alternatives. This is a picture that was made in the South Sudan. Uh, Ali, my wife and I were in Peru last year. We didn't see them, but in Lake Titicaca, right on the border of Bolivia, Bolivia and Peru, is very isolated, they have solar cells. So the same thing is happening as uh, mobile phones. The, the growth of mobile phones over the last 10 years has been enormous, and it's been enormous, particularly in underdeveloped countries, like countries like Indonesia. <coughs> they never got landlines. They went straight to mobile phones. Same thing is happening with this technology. The, Chil the Chilean solar market is a fantastic example of what has happened and what is currently happening in terms of installing solar panels and projected uh, installation of solar panels. What's the saying again? It's off the chart. Well, this is off the chart. Sun. There is enough solar... Uh, Enough solar energy reaches the Earth every hour, every hour, to fill all the world's need for a whole year. Amazing numbers. Uh, an another important factor is storage, s uh, storage of energy. Uh, again, Elon Musk. Uh, um, I don't have stock in his company, but I should. Uh, it's an, ama an amazing guy. Um, one of the things that he's working on really, really hard, the storage of electricity. LED lights, it's interesting. We're from Europe, and in, in, in Europe, incandescent lights, by law, were banned about 10 years ago. All of Europe. Uh, the U.S. is still working on it. Look at what's going on with the car manufacturers. All of them are jumping on the bandwagon, pun intended. Um, and particularly Ford. Uh, Ford is installing a, is, is in the process of installing an infrastructure because it's not just an infrastructure for batteries because it's not just the cars and electrical cars, but you need an infrastructure for that so that you can recharge quickly 
your your batteries and and Ford is developing that in a major way by the way there are there are some names on this chart I've never heard of them and I'll bet you they're in China there are like 50 car manufacturers in China so what do you think the answer is to this question anybody We can, and we will. Everybody heard of the Paris Agreement? Well, it's not hopeless, though, because the um, yeah, the United States wants to get out, but cannot get out until, I, I was planning to stay away from politics, but I, I gotta talk about this. No, it's a, it's a valid point. So, but um, most people don't know that we cannot, United States that is out of the Paris Agreement until November of 2020. This president does not have the power to do that yet. Climate marches, uh, there are currently climate marches going on every week, every day. You've probably heard about this young lady called Greta Thunberg out of Sweden, uh, a 17 year old. She took a year off school, not suggesting you do that, but she did it with support of her parents. See, right now, she's on a sailboat back to Europe. She's been in North America and in South America over the last uh, two months. And she's not burning any fossil fuel for transportation. She's taken the sailboat back to Europe to a conference in, uh, in Spain. Amazing young lady. But it's just one. There are millions of them. And you can be part of that. And you should be part of that. So. Join those who are using their choices, voices, and vote. Back to the planet, because that's where it's all about. A few can do, must reads, interesting stuff. But there's a guy called Paul Harkin, and I hope this library has uh, 10 of his books or more. Does anybody know? Are you familiar with this book, Project Drawdown? But we have a few. It's, a, it's, an, it's an amazing, amazing read. Uh, I only made a picture of the top 14. But what this basically is, the, these are all elements, all things that you can do things that are being done. And this last number uh, represents in gigatons the amount of total atmospheric reduction over a certain time period. And most of them are over a time period of 10 to 15 years. Now, the biggest one is refrigerant management. So the, uh, uh, the hydrocarbons, the fluor, chloro, hydrocarbons that are in air conditioning systems are a major, major contributor to uh, global warming. They've been banned in the meantime, but um, a lot of the growth in China and in other underdeveloped countries, uh, and it's kind of ironic, they install a lot of small air conditioning units because it gets so hot. Well, guess why that is? So, long list of things that can be done from solar. Th there is one, it's not on this list. I think it's number 16 or 17 on the list. And it's about women and the power, and I'm looking at you women here in the audience, the power of women. I'm not going into details here, but read up on it. It's very powerful. So, take the next step. Uh, get your cell phones out. Join a movement, become an activist. I never would have thought two years ago that I would become an activist. 
because I didn't think that I was the type of guy to become an activist, but it's powerful. Um, plant a tree. I'm going to give you, in a minute, uh, you can text this, or you can go to a website and uh, pull down a form that you would have to fill in, and then a tree will be planted somewhere in the world, a spot, from, it's your choice, uh, there's a list of 15 or so options, and a tree will be planted on your behalf for free. Um, I plugged in Sija. I, I'm not going to talk about that. The the acronym. Who speaks Spanish here? Anybody? Any? What does Sija mean in Spanish? Eyebrow. But that's a coincidence. It's an acronym that stands for uh, Clean Energy Job Act. It's in the House in Illinois. It's an incredibly important act that hopefully is going to be passed uh, early next year. If you want to know more about that or get involved in it, uh, pick up my sheet and my business card. I'll get you more information. So um, you can text to this number. For, that's the easiest way to do it. So a text to 406-49 and then type in 24 hours and you will get an immediate shortcut to a form that you can fill in, submit it, and uh, a tree will be planted. You can, al you can also go to the website, but the texting is probably the easiest way to go. I'm going to leave this up for another 10 seconds. Everybody got it? Everybody wants a tree? Sija, good choice, and thank you. Thank you very much to our three wonderful speakers here. Uh, now we have a few moments, we have about 15 minutes, well maybe 10 minutes, of questions. Does anyone have any questions? I can walk with the microphone. A better question is, where can we sign a C-Jot? So where can we, did you say C, where can they sign? Is there a website for CJA? Oh, I'll show you the shortcut. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions while we wait? Don't be shy. Hello. Uh, as uh, I believe in climate change, but I uh, adamantly disagree with you, and I appreciate you guys coming here. I think it's really important hearing opposing viewpoints. Uh, as my question is, you guys seem very adamant on uh, acknowledging the science of climate change. I was just wondering uh, why is it that people seem so adamant on ignoring climate or the sciences and other topics such as like abortion, transgenderism. I was wondering if you guys just like touch light on that and why people seem to be like that. Well, psychologically, the same principles apply. We have confirmation biases. Uh, we don't like our identities attacked. We seek out information that confirms what we believe. Uh, we tend to ignore others. It's, uh, so, so psychologically speaking, the same principles that apply why we would ignore the science of climate change would be the same reasons why we ignore any other sciences uh, that run counter to our beliefs and values. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. 
So um, I see a lot of stuff about climate change online and like how to reduce your carbon footprint and mm -hmm. stuff. But I like the majority of like these issues are caused by like big corporations. So I'm wondering like how to effectively like spread awareness to people, but also acknowledge that a lot of these things can be fixed by people with a lot of money. And like it's hard to be sort of environmentally aware if you don't have a lot of money or like something like that. It's yeah. Yeah. So I'll say it quick. Um, I mean, you can get involved as uh, cases, you know, showing us. But also, um, it goes back with the power of one, the power of you. It's it's the corporations have these products and these services because we consume them. It's that simple, and uh, they're in business to make money. And if we change what social norms are and what's acceptable behavior, organizations and corporations are going to have to follow suit. And as long as we, uh, you know, it, it goes to the point again of, of changing social norms and what's acceptable and making um, pro-environmental, sustainable choices the the norm. Yeah, I absolutely agree, and I understand that that sentiment is i think built in all of us so how much can we really do um and i think i'll go with mitch's point i think it's sort of the oh, it's a collectivism of all of us you know the the small things that we do whether it's you know refusing to take that you know plastic water bottle at the gathering at our families it's the you know what i'll carpool with people it's are there smaller things and no they don't have a measurable effect individually but it is changing the way that we approach energy and no nothing happens overnight but perhaps in five or a decade it might be interesting to see how those numbers that case put up change by just slowly and deliberately adjusting our behavior can I chime in here? I, I, I love that question. It's a very powerful, powerful question. And it's, it's driven. We all, I think we, you're not the only one who asked that question or should be asking that question. And it's, it's, it's driven by, uh, at least in my case, by um, not feeling that you don't have the power. And as an individual, maybe you don't. But as a group, you do. And I, I like to make the analogy with an oil tanker. So changing the direction, pun intended, by the way, changing the direction of a massive ship, like an oil tanker, is very time consuming. Uh, but it will happen as long as you keep pushing. That's where it boils down to. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? So don't you think that we should focus on the measurable changes more than like at the level that we are right now? Like we should push the government to do more for us because this is basically not our fault. Just like she said, it's like the culprit's mistakes, mostly. Could you rephrase your question a little bit so uh, I have a better understanding? Yes, I'm saying sh shouldn't we focus on the measurable changes more than like we should like the basic focus should be on the corporations and through the government uh, should force these new laws for the to save the environment I would suggest that that's absolutely what we should be doing if we want to see change it's got to start first at the local level and then it's got to push through you know the national level and yeah reaching out to your you know your political advocates is where it has to start um, it has to be a movement yeah I, you know to the point is that you it really is a grassroots thing. You know, it's the upper, you know, the, the income 
disparities, are, they're just not there. So the resources individuals have are, it's difficult to change a corporation's mind. But if you start, I, I believe that the, in the power of the individual. I think you can as an individual absolutely make a change. You have to realize that other people are watching you. You're social influencing too. You are sometimes the smartest person in the room. And you need to act upon that and not conform. Oh, everyone's doing this, so I'm just gonna do it too because it's easy. There's a lot of inertia in doing nothing. And that needs to break and that needs to stop. And that comes with mindfulness, being aware of what we're doing in each moment, being okay with the fact that what we're gonna engage in is slightly different. It might be looked at a little differently, but over time, it will become the norm. It will become the behaviors. And that's the only way this is gonna happen on a positive, with, with a positive ending. You know, so I mean, don't, we have to really avoid uh, excusing our own behavior away because everyone else is doing it. So that, that would be my suggestion. Start at the grassroots, start in your own community. Yes, thank you. Okay. I'm of the belief that um, maybe that wouldn't the best way to, that I believe that the best situation is to cause a huge inconvenience just because I feel like most social change has been achieved that way like labor laws have been, yep. hey, let's actively just not, just stop doing our work and cause a huge inconvenience, and then we have labor law changes. So, so the civil rights movement, like the March on Washington wasn't a ticker tape parade, it was causing active disrupt disruptance. Would that be sort of the best way to achieve this massive change that we sort of need? Just huge inconveniences. Like, it sucks, but like, I feel like that's the way we have to go about it. I, I love the way you frame this. Uh, climate reality, uh, I didn't show the slide, but there is a great movie. It's called An Inconvenient Truth, and, and book with the same title. Uh, some of you might, seen it, might have seen it. Some of you might have read it. Uh, but I, but I, I love the analogy with civil movements even the Civil War, if, if you will, uh, the labor movements, uh, women's votes, uh, long, long list. And it's all because you and me made that change, changing laws. And like, again, it's not even like, part of the grassroots thing involves just causing a stir of some kind you know, and it doesn't have to be pleasant. It can yeah. come up in the form of all kinds of not great things, but at the same time, that's sort of the best impetus. Like, just cause a stir. Yeah. But I'm not sure if that's something that people want to accept, you know? Like, what if our, our, march, what if our marches block traffic? And it's like, again, March on Washington, not a ticker tape parade. Well, it's going to be interesting to see how what's going on currently in Hong Kong, how that's going to end. And I think that's a perfect example of what you are alluding to. Organized disruption, you know, choosing kindness, you know, keeping uh, people safe. Uh, yeah, those are all uh, things that mobilize change. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, once again, thank you so much for our panel.